Let's sum up those variables in our system. As you can see, the number of variables is significant. Consider also that in the power plant we're using as an example, there is not only one mill, but eight mills surrounding the boiler. So that means we have eight primary dampers, eight secondary dampers, eight overfire dampers, and so on. This dynamic nature of the power plant makes it necessary for the controller to be also dynamic. It has to adapt to changing conditions without too much overhead. That said, I'm going to go over the goals now we have for such an optimizer. Foremost, the optimizer has to ensure that both NOx and CO remain under the legal limit. With that constraint, it then aims to minimize the amount of oxygen needed to improve the efficiency. If not all of the mills around the boiler are active, this can lead to uneven coal distribution of coal entering the combustion chamber, and hence lower efficiency. The optimizer also aims to control the air dampers, so that coal distribution inside the boiler is as even as possible. Finally, high temperatures inside the boiler do mean more thorough combustion, but they can also lead to slagging. That's when ashes become soft and stick to the walls. So the optimizer needs to control the furnace exit temperature so it is high enough for thorough combustion, but not too high that it leads to slagging. If this is not complicated enough, the optimizer needs to maintain boundary conditions such as mill temperatures, classifier temperatures, and flue gas temperatures for lignite coals. If any of these boundary conditions are violated, then the optimizer needs to react accordingly. Now that we have the issues and goals behind us, we'll move on to see what the solution looks like. Here are the big picture goals for the optimizer. No change to infrastructure. It must be dynamic and adaptive. It should be thoroughly tested and, of course, user-friendly. By using the existing data communication system, OPC server and analog digital signals, and attaching to it, we almost eliminate any changes to the infrastructure. The hardware needed will then only be the computers needed to run the optimizer itself and the connections to the data system. To keep the optimizer adaptive and dynamic, model predictive control is employed. It uses recent data from the power plant to create a process model using system identification used for prediction. For this, we use widely available tools like MATLAB, Model Predictive Control Toolbox, and the System Identification Toolbox. Thorough testing is a must for a project this scale, but extensive on-site testing is prohibitive because of both cost and safety. This is where model-based design comes into rescue. Using our Simulink thermodynamic modeling tool, Thermalib, we build a model of the plant against which extensive mill and hill tests are performed. How the optimizer will behave in unlikely scenarios is also tested. Finally, to make it user-friendly, an intuitive interface that replaces the structure of the plant is used. This user interface uses several security layers so that only qualified people can run the optimizer. For today, and before we move on to the results, we'll go over both how model predictive and model-based design were used. Then we'll take a quick look at the interface. The major issue is that we have a complex dynamic system with many interdependent variables. We divide our variables into independent variables, what we can change, dependent variables, what we aim to change, and disturbances, what we can only consider but not change. The basic strategy behind model predictive control is to build a cost function that includes all of the variables in your system and then minimize this function. The question is how to build this cost function. I'll show you very quickly how to do that. We will take a control variable, a dependent variable. Define t is now. We would like the variable to approach a certain set. We have here how the variable behaved in the past and how we expect it to behave in the near future. Then we define how we would like it to behave. The cost function for this variable is then y predicted minus y reference, which we will aim to reduce to zero. To avoid negative values, we square it, and then we add the costs for all the control variables in the system. We repeat the whole process, for instance, for a manipulated variable. The manipulated variable that we will change ourselves, we account for the changes from one time step to the next, and we do that for all the manipulated variables in the system. Certain manipulated variables have optimal resting positions. For those, we use the same formula as for control variables. That is the difference between the future calculated value and the optimal resting value. 
Finally, for control variables that have an upper limit instead of a set point, for example, NOx and CO, we define the cost as any difference between the variable and the upper limit above zero. In other words, any time the variable exceeds its upper limit, it adds to the cost function. In this manner, the cost function accounts for all the control and manipulated variables in my system. To change the priority of one control or a manipulated variable over another, we assign weights to each term of the cost equation. The higher the weight for a variable, the higher the cost for this variable, and the faster the optimizer will try to minimize it. In other words, higher weight equals higher priority. This gives us a lot of flexibility in modifying our optimizing strategy by adjusting our criteria with weights. As I mentioned before, the goal is to minimize the cost function. I optimize my controls for the control horizon by minimizing the cost function for the prediction horizon. At this point, the question begs itself, where do we get the predicted values of our control variables? For that, we need process models for the control variables. We do that by using past inputs and outputs over a defined time frame, and then we attempt to derive a model that describes the behavior of the control variable in relation to all the other variables in my system. Functions, part of the system identification toolbox, takes the overhead out of such a task. For our optimizer, we create models for the main control variables, NOx, CO, and oxygen. We then use these models to calculate our predicted values of these variables over the prediction horizon. This is what the controller looks like. We use past inputs and outputs to create, calculate a physical process model for each of the variables using the system identification toolbox. Using these models, we calculate the predicted output for the prediction horizon. We then define our cost function, attach weights to the different variables, and minimize the cost function. The result is the manipulated variables for the next type step. The optimization is done using the model predictive control toolbox. Even though we calculated the values for the manipulated variables over the entire control horizon, we use the first value for this time step and repeat the whole process at the next time step. So here is again the big picture view. We get measured values for all of our variables from the power plant, calculate the man manipulated variables using model predictive control for this time step, and then repeat the whole process at the next time step. Now let's move on to model-based design and how it keeps development costs down. The idea of model-based design is simple. Before you test your controller or optimizer against a real power plant, first design and test it against a model of the plant. That leads to the question of how much of an effort does it require to simulate a power plant. What we have here is a model of the plant built in Simulink and uses the thermodynamic simulation toolbox Thermalib. It offers blocks for reaction chemistry, pumps and valves, and these cut down significantly on the development cost. I'll jump directly here to Simulink to show you what it looks like. The plant model we developed for this project simulates the combustion cycle. We used mainly the toolbox Thermalib to simulate the thermodynamic behavior in Simulink. Seeing we have eight mills working, so to speak, in parallel, we had to modify some of the Thermalib blocks to accommodate that. The top part is basically the input and output values to the model, and the model itself is in the lower part, so I'll zoom to that. Here you see the three main sections of the combustion cycle. The mills, the air distribution amongst the dampers, and the combustion chamber. The mills receive coal from a source block. Inside the mill, this coal is dried from excess moisture by using the flue gas flowing back from the combustion chamber. In the air distribution section, air from a source block is distributed among the different dampers for each mill. If we look inside this block, You can see that each of the eight mills has its own distribution block. And if we check the first one, for instance, you see here that the dampers are modeled via thermolib valve blocks. You have here the primary, secondary dampers, overfire dampers, and so on. And this is repeated for each of the eight mills. Let's go back to the top view. The coal from the mills and air from the air distribution is forwarded to the combustion chamber. Now let's take a look inside the combustion chamber. 
The different levels of combustion are modeled. We have primary air, secondary air, the combustion chamber itself, and in this case of this particular power plant, the overfire levels one and two. At the primary level, air and coal are mixed, but no reaction takes place. At the secondary level, additional air is mixed into the coal, and at this point, combustion starts to take place. This is modeled by a chemical reactor. If we look at it, you can see the different reactions of carbon and oxygen. In this model, we are not simulating the steam cycle, so we have to account for the heat loss to the pipes. What we have here is water flow into the chemical reactor to simulate the cooling effect the pipes have. The overfire air levels 1 and 2 are modeled very similarly to the secondary air level. Air is mixed from the dampers and combustion takes place in the reactor. Water flow simulates the cooling effect from the water pipes. Now let's have a quick look inside the combustion chamber itself. 